Hello and welcome back everybody to a brand new fresh out of the oven episode of Tomorrow News. We're now only a few days out until the net date for the launch of Inspiration 4. So you're getting a bit of a pre-launch preview and Starship Booster 4 has been lifted onto the pad down in Starbase. So stay tuned as this is your episode of Tomorrow News for the week of September 13th, 2021. September 16th at exactly midnight coordinated universal time is when the launch window is scheduled to open for the first ever fully private crewed mission to orbit with Jared Isaacman, Haley Arsenault, Chris Zembrowski and Dr. Cyan Proctor all on board Inspiration4. Starting off this pre-launch preview, let's meet the commander of the mission and the person who bought all four seats of the mission, Jared Isaacman. Born on February 11th, 1983, he is the founder and CEO of Shift4 Payments, which is an industry-leading payments technology company with over 1,200 employees and it is used by roughly 250,000 entities. He is also rated to fly commercial and military aircraft and, to put the icing on the cake, he holds several world records, including two speed around the world flights in 2008 and 2009, the latter being set in just under 62 hours. Next up, it's the pilot Dr. Siam Proctor. Born on March 28th, 1970 in Hagat near Guam, she grew up with space in her life as her father worked on the Guam remote ground terminal during the time period of the Apollo missions. She is an analog astronaut, which is a person who conducts activities in simulated space conditions, and she uses her Shift4 shop, myspace2inspire.com, to sell her space-inspired art. The third seat goes to medical officer Haley Arsenault, who, at the age of 29, will become the youngest American to ever orbit the Earth. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on December 4th, 1991, she was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, a type of bone cancer, when she was 10 years old. Her parents turned to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital hospital for her treatment, which included a knee replacement and chemotherapy where she managed to beat her fight with cancer. She obtained an undergraduate degree in Spanish in 2014 and obtained her physician assistant degree in 2016. She now works as a PA with leukemia and lymphoma patients at St. Jude. And last but not least, mission specialist Christopher Simbroski. Born on August 28, 1979, he grew up in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Whilst at college, Chris served as a counsellor at Space Camp an educational camp in Huntsville, Alabama. He also volunteered for ProSpace, which is a non-profit organisation that advocates for private spaceflight. Interestingly, Chris wasn't the first person to be selected for this seat. It was his friend, but as they were unable to make the flight, they recommended Chris, and as he had also donated to St. Jude, he made the cut to join the mission. Dragon Resilience, the vehicle the crew will be travelling in for three days, has been mated to Falcon 9 B1062, which has previously carried the GPS-3 Space Vehicle 4 and GPS-3 Space Vehicle 5 missions. It's currently in the hangar at Historic Launch Complex 39A. The Inspiration4 logo has also been emblazoned upon the side of Resilience, the vehicle that was previously used for Crew-1 and is planned to be used for Axion-1, the next planned fully private crewed mission to orbit. It isn't just the Dragon and the Falcon which have arrived at the Kennedy Space Center, it's also the crew, with Haley taking the selfie on the flight to Florida. The orbit that the four will be heading to is a 590 kilometer low Earth orbit, which will be the highest orbit a crewed mission has reached since the STS-103 shuttle mission back in 1999. And because of this, the crew will be exposed to more radiation than the humans on board the International Space Station. One of the reasons why they won't just be sitting, or should I say floating, around all day. The four will be conducting research such as collecting ECG activity, movement, sleep, heart rate and rhythm, blood oxygen saturation, cabin noise, and to top it all off, light intensity data. Teams are also going to be gathering data on the molecular processes inside the body and how they change throughout the three-day flight. Not only is Inspiration4 going to space, it's also landed a Netflix deal with five episodes being able to be streamed from the subscription service. I would show you the trailer but I don't fancy giving the Tomorrow Channel a copyright strike so I'll just link it below. And I haven't even reached the best part yet. Not only are Netflix going to be covering the mission, but we are as well. Tomorrow is launching a mini-series with the first episode releasing this Thursday, September 16th, and at least two more daily episodes after that, covering each day of the mission, and then to top it all off, a big mission roundup in next week's episode of the news. So to make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you are subscribed and that you hit that notification bell so you're notified every time we upload an Inspiration4 update. 
We're starting off this week's SpaceX update with the lifting of Booster 4 which has been placed onto the orbital launch mount with all 29 Raptor engines attached to the underside of the rocket. It isn't only Booster 4 doing the exciting business however as Booster 5 has begun stacking in the high bay. This part in particular is a common dome section, the dome inside being the top of the liquid oxygen tank and the bottom of the methane tank. Some other ring sections have been laying around next to the high bay. I can count six here and it's likely that these will be going to either Booster 5 or another future booster, ship or even test tank. A new claw has also been spotted and at the moment we aren't sure whether it's for the quick disconnect arm or part of the catching system dubbed Mechazilla. Another structure has been seen which is believed by most people to be an extension for the ship QD arm. And to round things off in Boca Chica, Elon Musk has released some information on when we will get to see all 29 engines on Booster 4 light up. Quote, Booster static fire on orbital launch mount hopefully next week, which means there is a good chance of us seeing the Raptors roar within the next seven days. There have been a couple launches in the last few days, so let's take a look in our space traffic report. Lifting off from LC9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center in China at 0240 UTC on September 6th, a Long March 40 carried the CNSA's Gaofun 502 mission to an unknown sun-synchronous orbit. The Gaofun satellites are Earth imaging satellites which allow Chinese citizens to collect near real-time observations for geographical mapping, climate change monitoring and several other observation activities. Lifting off at 11.50 coordinated universal time on September 9th from LC2 at the Ji Chang Satellite Launch Center, this Long March 3BE carried the 5,100 kg Zhongxing 9B satellite to a geostationary orbit around the Earth. It is a communication satellite which will replace the existing Zhongxing 9A satellite. And the final launch to cover is the launch of the Razbeg-1 military satellite atop this Soyuz 2.1V. Lifting off from Site-43 Pad-4 at the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in Russia, all 250 kilograms of satellites are headed for a 97 degree sun-synchronous orbit. Because this is a military payload, it is of course classified, so we don't actually know anything else about it. That's the launches from the last seven days, so let's take a look at some upcoming ones. First on the list we've got the launch of the second shell of Starlink, then OneWeb 10, and then the launch of Inspiration 4. And here is your space weather with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Space weather this week is definitely keeping us on our toes. As we take a look at the Earth-facing sun, look at all these bright regions, both in the north and in the south. As a matter of fact, early on the 8th, wham, do you see that? That is region 2864, and it launches a partially Earth-directed solar storm that goes off to Earth's west. Now, it has given us a glancing blow, but it's not really done much, but bump us up to active conditions. Meanwhile, shortly thereafter, whoosh, do you see that? That is a filament an eruption and that launches a solar storm, that one looks like it's going to go east of Earth. So we're kind of getting missed on either side. But meanwhile, we still have a lot of activity. We do even have a filament. If you can see this thing, this is crossing through the Earth's strike zone right now. And if it erupts, it could launch a solar storm directed toward Earth. So we're definitely on pins and needles. Meanwhile, as these regions rotate off of the Earth-facing disk, it looks like we'll finally see a little bit of a quiet period and we'll get kind of a little bit of a respite for at least a few days before more regions begin to rotate into Earth view. Now taking a closer look at the active regions on the Earth-facing disk, we switch to the HMI instrument aboard the SDO spacecraft that allows us to take a look at the magnetic complexity of these regions. Now as you look at them, the more colors you see and the more mixing you see, that should be an eye-opener for you. So we have a lot of regions on the Earth-facing disk, but the real big ones, as you can see, are regions 2866 and regions 2868. These regions have been growing quite a bit over this past week, and their level of complexity has been varying a little bit. But I tell you, it's definitely making them big flare players. As a matter of fact, NOAA has given us about a 5% chance of an X-class flare with these regions, so we are watching them very carefully. Now, as you can see, most of these regions are going to be rotating off of the Earth-facing disk here in the next few days, probably three or four days. And so we'll see that solar flux 
drop a bit uh, over the next week from probably the um, low 90s down into the maybe mid 80s or so. But until then, amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect that uh, radio blackouts could be an issue for you. So stay vigilant. And then also expect over the next few days, at least for you amateur radio operators, to get it kind of a bit of a fizzle when it comes to radio propagation on Earth's day side. For more details on this week's space weather, including whether or not those big flare players could affect you, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Just before we leave for this week, let's take a moment to thank all of the citizens of tomorrow. Without their continued support of the show, we wouldn't be able to continue bringing you these weekly updates of the universe's space news. If you'd like to join the Escape Velocity Orbital Suborbital or Orion Support Citizens, head on over to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join and become a member for as little as a dollar a month. Financial support isn't required. Even just sharing the show around with your friends and family helps us a great deal. But if you want to get a little sneak peek at the scripts, I consider taking a look. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay safe and goodbye.